Thank you everybody for joining with us today. Obviously, we're here to talk about the border. Uh, I want to thank everybody who is up here with me today. Uh, we got uh, the chair of the House Appropriations Committee, uh, Greg Vine. We have the Speaker of the House State Feeling. We have the Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick and the Chair of Senate Finance, uh, Jane Nelson, as well as members of both the Texas House and Senate who gather with us for this announcement. And that is the problems that people are suffering on the border just continue to get worse. And they're getting worse for the residents who live in that region. They're getting worse for people in all regions across the entire state of Texas. If you just look at the numbers, they paint the picture. Look at the number of people who were apprehended coming across the border last April when President Trump was president. They apprehended just over 17,000 people coming across the border last year. This year, in the month of April, they apprehended more than 170,000 people. That is a 1,000% increase in the number of people apprehended coming across the border year over year. Similar numbers were echoed in the month of May. Also, the, num the, the, the type of people coming across the border is changing. Early on, it was unaccompanied minors. Now, a majority of the people coming across the border are adults coming across alone. Also, what is changing is the carnage that is being caused by the people who are coming across the border. Fences of ranchers along the border are being completely decimating, causing border ranchers to lose their livestock or border farmers to lose their crops. Homes are being invaded. Neighborhoods are dangerous and people are being threatened on a daily basis with guns of people either coming across the border or those working with those who are coming across the border. Cartels, human and drug smugglers, and human traffickers, they, they're all profiting off of our open border crisis. They're making money off the people that have come in from more than 150 different countries across the entire globe. Anybody who tells you this is people coming across from Mexico or from the Northern Triangle, they're missing the point about the massive consequence of all the countries across all the entire globe that people are coming from, and they will either fly in or somehow get into Mexico or get in South America and make their way up to come across the border into Texas and into other states. And make no mistake, the border crisis that we're dealing with right now is a direct result of the open border policies that have been put into place by the Biden administration. Remember that the border was far more under control under the Trump administration until President Biden came in and removed the remain in Mexico policy. And he's about to remove, according to his administration, the Title 42 policy. And obviously they are now not making any effort whatsoever in, to construct the wall. In fact, they are abandoning finishing the wall along the border. But the biggest difference between the two administrations is a difference in commitment. There was a commitment by the prior administration to actually enforce the immigration laws that were passed by the United States Congress. Make no mistake, the current administration is refusing to enforce the laws concerning immigration that are on the books passed by the United States Congress. Well, in response to the federal government's neglect of all of the 
people who live along the border and the other people who live inland who are facing the consequences because of the spread of drugs like fentanyl, Texas is stepping up and doing more than any other state ever has done to respond to challenges along the border. Because of these leaders that you see at this table right now, as well as the members behind them, they just passed a budget adding more than a billion dollars dedicated to border security in the state of Texas for Texas to do the federal government's job. These are Texas taxpayer dollars that Texans should not have to be paying for because the federal government has a legal responsibility under the federal immigration laws to do it. But because they are not doing it, Texas taxpayers are having to step up so that we as a state can protect our citizens. In addition to that, in March of this year, because the Biden administration was, was abandoning its responsibility, I launched Operation Lone Star. That included the, uh, the deployment of a thousand Texas Department of Public Safety officers. It included the deployment of the National Guard. And they've been making arrests. They've made over 1,500 arrests already. They've already apprehended more than 35,000 people coming across the border illegally. But it's clear that this Operation Lone Star, as prolific as the results have been, it's clear that more is needed. And the people who made that clear are the counties on the border. Because what the counties on the border did, they sent me a disaster declaration that the counties made requesting that the governor of Texas make a disaster declaration for the counties on the border. Now, the governor makes disaster declarations when we have hurricanes come in, sometimes when tornadoes occur, sometimes when floods may occur. I am unaware of a governor ever declaring a disaster at county requests because of the tidal wave of illegal immigrants coming across the border wrecking havoc in communities and residents who live here in Texas. And since I went down to Del Rio last week, what I talked to sheriffs and county judges at that time about was to issue a second disaster declaration for which there are more than two dozen counties who already want to be a part of it, even though the new disaster declaration has not even been issued yet. But it's going to concentrate on making arrests on the border of people who are coming across. So the Department of Public Safety will work with local officials to arrest anybody illegally for, uh, for violations such as trespass, for vandalism, for criminal mischief, for smuggling. Speaking of which, the people that you're looking up here right now, the members of the Texas House and Texas Senate, they passed a new smuggling law that makes it easier for prosecutors to be able to prosecute smuggling in the state of Texas, and I applaud them for passing that. And the prosecutors in the region were urging and begging for it so that they would be able to prosecute these smugglers. And you will see that there is going to be a lot more people put into jail, people who are crossing the border illegally and trespassing, or people who are engaging in the smuggling process or drug smuggling process or any of these crimes that are occurring anywhere. But we wanted to make sure they had the tools and the resources they need to be able to put those people in jail. But that does mean that more jail space will be needed. And to help accommodate that, the Texas Commission on Jail Standards is working with counties to be able to expand jail space. To enhance, but before I go there, let me say this. I want to applaud and thank fellow states across America. When I was in Del Rio, I had an, an announcement that night about how uh, myself as well as the Arizona Governor Doug Ducey, uh, we entered into a, a multi-state compact, or we triggered a multi-state compact that responds to emergencies and disasters. And we asked governors of other states to join in with us to help address the disaster that we're facing. And there have been a number of states that have already offered support or are working with their office about support, and they include our neighbors, Oklahoma and Arkansas. It stretches up to North Dakota and South Dakota, and includes Iowa and Florida. 
Georgia and South Carolina have sent their National Guard to the Texas border, and we appreciate all of them as well as others that I may be unaware of yet because this is happening as we speak right now. But for every state stepping up, just know that the people of the state of Texas, your fellow Americans, appreciate you stepping up. But I'll, I'll add this. For all the states that are stepping up to help Texas, you're helping your own residents, if nothing else, by helping to prevent or reduce the amount of fentanyl that is coming into the United States. Let me give you some quick numbers that are very important. In just the first four months of this year, just the Texas Department of Public Safety had an 800% increase in the amount of fentanyl uh, that they had apprehended coming across the border. In just the four, first four months of this year, just the Texas Department of Public Safety, they apprehended enough fentanyl to kill more than 21 million Americans. And that fentanyl goes to states across the entire country. Every state helping out Texas, you're helping your own citizens and residents in your state from dealing with this deadly drug coming to neighborhoods near you. Well, the ability for us to be able to arrest people coming across the border is going to be enhanced by Texas building border barriers. Some of those barriers are being built immediately, and that includes things like fencing. That is taking place during this press conference right now. As we speak, there are state agencies talking to landowners on the border about putting up fencing on their private land to be able to prevent the dramatic influx that these landowners have been suffering from over the past few months. These immediate barriers are truly just a stopgap effort to slow the incredible inflow of migrants into Texas. But they do create what are considered to be no trespass zones that can lead to arrest trespassers. When there is a barrier up, it will have on it do not trespass signs. Anybody who comes through or around uh, or near that barrier is subject to being arrested for aggravated trespass. And because these counties are subject to a disaster declaration, the penalties for that trespass have been enhanced so that they are at a minimum a Class B misdemeanor or potentially a Class A misdemeanor, which means they could spend a long time behind jail for violating the trespass laws of Texas. But listen, we know that temporary barriers and fences won't be enough to slow the flow of the record amount of illegal immigration that's taken place. That's why today we are announcing that Texas will build a border wall in our state to help secure our border. Here's uh, how the process is going to begin and how it will be structured. We start by hiring a program manager. This is going to be a large scale construction project that needs a program manager to oversee it. The program manager are contractors and subcontractors to complete the project. I can add this and that is to speed the process as well as to lower the cost of the project. The project manager, the project manager can look to land that's already owned either by the state of Texas or owned by the local governments or owned by private citizens who want to volunteer that land for locations where a border wall can be placed. My belief based upon conversations that I've already had is that the combination of state land as well as volunteer land will yield hundreds of miles of a border wall in Texas. The program manager and the contractors once they get to work, they will be able to provide us with a more accurate estimate of what the cost will look like going forward. To get all of this going, we need to hire the program manager. And that process begins right now. I am signing a letter that is from me directed to the executive director of the Texas Facilities Commission. It says, in just a couple of sentences of it, it says, as the state agency in charge of procuring, building, and managing state-owned property, your work is central to building projects in our state. 
I hereby direct the Texas Facilities Commission to hire a program manager to oversee construction of a Texas border wall. A program manager will lead the process of planning and scoping the project and hiring the contractors and subcontractors needed to build the wall. Building the wall in Texas has officially begun. Next is funding. A letter that we are about to sign provides $250 million to be allocated as a down payment to begin the border wall. That's a quarter of a billion dollars and it's more than enough to hire the project manager and the contractors and to begin building the wall. And we are committed to adding more resources as needed going forward. Let me start, start with you all down here. Let me see. Pen, if you sign it, and we keep the pen. All right. This program is officially funded in the state of Texas. Today, I am also sending a letter to President Biden. His administration is refusing to finish the border wall on land that the federal government took from our fellow Texans. I am demanding that the Biden administration immediately return to Texans land that the federal government took to build the wall. Texas will talk to those property owners about Texas using that land to build the wall. President Biden, return Texas land to Texas. Now, I know for a fact that many Texans and many Americans want to get involved in this process. Many have already sent checks to the state of Texas for this purpose, and many more have a desire to do so. And we want to give them an opportunity to donate. One place they can donate to is at this sign right here. If you look at this, this provides a donation site, as well as a site where you can find out more information about what the process is about building the border wall. Go to borderwall.texas.gov, and front and center is going to be a red icon you can click on for the purpose of donating. Again, that is borderwall.texas.gov. If you want to send a check by mail like we've already received, we have an address designated for that. Send it to Texas Border Wall, P.O. Box 13226. Austin, Texas, 78711. That's Texas Border Wall, P.O. Box 13226, Austin, Texas, 78711. I know the media will be very interested on the transparency and accountability of this money. Know that it's going to be overseen by two agencies. One is the Texas Division of Emergency Management. The other is the Office of, of the Governor. And we expect full transparency and accountability so the public will know all the money coming in and how that money is being used. The bottom line is this. The Biden administration has abandoned its responsibility to apply federal law to secure the border and to enforce the immigration laws. 
and Texans are suffering as a consequence of that neglect by the Biden administration. In the federal government's absence, Texas is stepping up to get the job done. We will build the wall, we will secure the border, but most importantly, we will restore safety to the citizens who live in the Lone Star State. I'm going to turn it over to the Lieutenant Governor. Governor, thank you for your leadership. I believe that this is the most consequential uh, letter and document and resolution signed by any governor in modern history. This document uh, will go down as one of the most important documents in the history of Texas because it's reclaiming our land, our border, our country, our state for the people of Texas and America. We are being invaded. That term has been used in the past, but it's never been more true. We're on pace to apprehend nearly 2 million people this year compared to four to 500,000 in the past. For every one we catch, we don't know how many we don't catch, but if it's two to one or three to one, that means this year two to three million people could be coming into Texas and into America. The questions are never asked by anyone on the left or in the administration of what happens to these people. What do you do with a four-year-old boy from Central America who doesn't speak English who's three grade levels behind? What does he do when he comes to America and they just let him go free? You can't put a 14-year-old in the fifth grade class. What is his future? Crime, low wages, no future. What happens in our health care system, our emergency rooms? What's the reality of the people coming? The criminals that are filling up MS-13 and other gangs in the state and all across the country, making them more powerful. The drugs that are coming. This is a fight for our survival. Since the governor and I were elected in 2014, along with our finance chair, Jane Nelson, governor, the total is now, with this current budget, Texas taxpayers will have spent $4.4 billion. That's 4.4, just since 2015, doing the work that the federal government should be doing. They have left us no choice. President Trump was getting the border under control. Had we had four more years with him, we would be in total control of this border. But all of the protocols that he set in place, the wall that he was building that now President Biden is no longer funding, are sending us in the opposite direction. President Biden has made the choice that he's letting the drug cartels take control of this country instead of the rule of law. Texans will get this done. We will get this done. We have no choice to get it done. We will not let our state and our country be invaded. We will not let it happen. And Governor, thank you. Thank you for taking the lead on this. Thank you. Now, Speaker Dave Fiena. And Governor, I want to thank you as well for your leadership and your ingenuity in finding a Texas solution to a Washington, D.C. problem, but that's what it's come to, and uh, I appreciate your leadership. The This is a, a legal crisis. This is a, a security crisis. This is a humanitarian crisis. These are children and families being smuggled across the border. These are drug cartels bringing in weapons. They end up on the streets of not just Texas, but this entire country. And I speak for the vast majority of the Texas House, a bipartisan group that feels like enough's enough. And we've come to the point now where we have to think outside the box. And that's what the governor has done with this initiative. And to that end, in the coming days, I will be handing out a list of interim charges to House committees, Homeland Security, Public Safety appropriations, public health, human services, education, criminal jurisprudence, corrections. How has this surge impacted our border communities and communities beyond? Because it's vast and it's widespread. And we get it, we do all we can for our border communities. They are they're asking for help. They're seeking 
assistance from the state of Texas, and that's why we're here today. And in those hearings, we're going to hear from county judges and from mayors, and sheriffs, and police chiefs, and healthcare professionals, educators, district attorneys. We want to hear their stories because they're not getting the attention they need from Washington, D.C. A letter was sent out today from a Democratic congressman begging for the administration to come down and hear the stories of his community. So in the Texas House, we're going to hear those stories. I hear there's a special session coming soon. I don't know when. <laughs> but we're going to start having those hearings when we reconvene here in Austin. I want to thank the governor again for his, his leadership, his ingenuity, and the fact that he's prioritized accountability, transparency, and private property rights of Texans with this new border security plan. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, I'll close with this and then take a few questions. To the people who live in border regions, you've been begging for help. You've been demanding a response. You've pled with urgency to be protected, to be supported, to be heard, to have a response. I told you that Texas would step up and respond. Today, we begin that response. We'll take a few questions. Governor, Governor, if I may, the state of Florida has announced that it's going to deploy some officers in the state of Texas. Governor DeSantis announced that, I believe, today or sometime earlier this week. How is that going to work out? And can you explain, are these officers going to be deployed at the border along with Texas National Guard State Troopers and so forth? First, I, I thank Florida and the other states who are stepping up to assist. Uh, with regard to the officers they will send, it will depend upon which type of officers they send. They could send officers who would be engaged in arrests. I know requests have also been sent out uh, for additional jailers. I didn't mention this de detail. I'll apply it to your question. I mentioned in my remarks we need more jail beds. Uh, the Texas Jail Commission has found about a thousand jail beds. They need staff to staff those jail beds as well as others that may come open. So some states may send officers who may be involved in jails. Others could be officers involved in making the arrest. It will depend on who they send and they will work with various different agencies. It could be with the Texas Jail Commission. It could be with local officials or it could be the Texas Department of Public Safety. Where's the money coming from? Is it coming from the budget? Is it coming from the budget? So we have the, the budget experts uh, who are prepared to answer that question, and I will let them answer that question. Governor Abbott. Hold on. Those people. <laughs> tell you what, I'll cut you a deal. I'll make sure you get to ask a question today. <laughs> yeah, it's as is outlined in the, the letter that, that we have uh, just signed, you'll see that the initial down payment of $250 million is going to be transferred into a disaster account, and then it will be then moved to the uh, facilities commission for this purpose for the for this project. It is an appropriation. Uh, th actually, these funds have already been appropriated, and so uh, this is uh, a, a, an allocation of funds that have already been appropriated. I can help. I, I, can, I can help. Yes, um, when the governor issues a disaster declaration, the legislative budget board has the authority under Article Nine, Section. Uh, 14.04, uh, my staff's around somewhere, they're shaking their head yes, uh, to allow for the LBB can make a transfer under that section. We will do that uh, under request. We, we can make that request. I promise this guy come back. I, I apologize. Sorry. Things are, uh, several members of the, I'm Hayden Sparks with Texan, several members of the Texas legislature co authored legislation to fund a state border wall. What would you say to Texans who are curious as to why it's a priority now as opposed to the regular session? Sure. And also, what is the state doing to defend the border wall and for if that's decided to challenge? Sure. First, you got to understand the multiple steps that Texas has taken. Uh, it, as the Lieutenant Governor made clear, Beginning in 2015, uh, under my administration, in collaboration with Lieutenant Governor and the other office holders at that time, Texas began to step up and allocate money to secure the border. That strategy was lessened to some extent over the past four years when we had President Trump in office who did more than anybody's ever done 
to secure the border, in including uh, adding personnel, working in collaboration with the state of Texas, but also beginning the process of building the wall, the Remain in Mexico policy, the Title 42 policy, etc. And as a result of President Trump's efforts, it led to a dramatic decrease in the amount of people coming across the border. As I pointed out in my remarks earlier, in uh, the, the second full month of the Biden administration, which was in the month of March, uh, in response to the Biden administration's lack of commitment to secure the border, uh, we launched Operation Lone Star. This is a strategy that we have used in the past uh, of flooding the border with law enforcement officials and National Guard that has yielded positive results. And in fact, this time it yielded positive results also. As I pointed out, it led to the arrest of 1,500 criminals as well as to the apprehension of more than 35,000 people who came across the border. However, it was after that that it was determined that we could continue adding more arresting people to the border, but it wasn't going to yield the same results they had in the past for one reason. That's because we had been turning them over to federal officials who would then release them. And that's just not going to work. Uh, and that's when we had to begin to come up with new strategies that would be effective, which includes this immediate fencing, which includes the border wall, which includes uh, the new arrest policy. The point of this new arrest policy, they're being arrested for state law violations, not federal law violations, which means we don't have to turn them over to the federal government. We turn them over to a jail cell. Governor, I have a quick question about, about some of the residents that are living in South Texas. You mentioned some of the residents speaking with them. There is obviously a concern about the immigration and the crisis along the border. However, a lot of residents in Texas are concerned about the power grid, for example, and other issues facing Texans. Critics will say that this is political theater and that there's no reality of finishing the border wall that Trump started. How do you respond to those critics? Well, I mean, do you, do you want me to answer the power grid question? You've got, you got multiple aspects. I'd love for you to answer both, actually. Yeah. So both power grid and what's the other? And how do you, uh, do you respond to people who say that this is more of a political okay. For, okay, for, uh, ploy so than actual reality? Anyone who thinks this is politics doesn't have a clue what's going on on the border. Anyone who thinks this is politics doesn't care about American citizens or Texas residents. Anyone who thinks this is politics doesn't care about the lives of people who had a gun stuck to their head by someone who came across the border, doesn't care about their kids who have been harmed, doesn't care about the homes that have been invaded, doesn't care about the danger these people live with every single day. It's our job to keep these people safe, not allow them to continue to be subject, subjected to harm. We care about our fellow Texans and their safety, and this is providing safety for our fellow Texans. I realize, candidly, there are some who do not care about safety, and those are the very same people who want to defund police. And we together also pass a law to make sure that cities in Texas would not be able to defund police. We believe in the rule of law and law and order in this state, and by God, we're going to step up and deliver that rule of law and law and order in the state. Regard to the power grid, I'll tell you this. Everyone who's been trying to make a big deal of the power grid over the past two days, I have found were the exact same people who called me a Neanderthal mm. after I opened up Texas 100%. They were hoping there would be a power failure. Understand what happened over the last two days, which a lot of people really don't know. And that is, there was a conservation notice sent out by ERCOT. Anybody who lives in the state of Texas knows that water conservation are sent out in the summer because of summer heat. You should not be using your water sprinkler during the time of the day because it's not efficient. All ERCOT was doing was saying that because repairs were being made to power generators that amounted to uh, 9,000 megawatts of power, there was going to be less power available than there had been before, and that meant you needed to engage in a level of conservation. What that means, what, what that meant is for four hours in, in high demand, which I think was from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m., if possible, you should try to reduce your usage of power during that time. During the other 20 hours of the day, it didn't matter. And then the corollary of that is even though I've already signed all of the power grid laws, 
while for them to go into full effect. It takes a while for them to be fully implemented. So we have seen basically zero implementation, but we did see one component of it implemented. One demand made by the legislature, but also a demand made by the public, was greater communication by ERCOT to let people know what was going on. This was an example of that greater communication to let people know what was going on. Not that there was an, a, a power emergency. If you go into the ERCOT database, if you go to their, their website, uh, if, if, if you go to their app, which I use on my, on my phone, uh, you, you will see there are different uh, uh, energy uh, emergency alerts. And that is when power is really thin. We didn't enter into an energy emergency alert. It was just a conserved power, if you can, so that we'll make it through the couple of days that were needed as those repairs were made, which we have made it through those couple of days now. And candidly coming out is good news in this regard. To those 9,000 megawatts of power generators that were being repaired, they got the repairs done now before the real heat of summer hits. And they, sh they should be prepared to go through the summer uh, fully capable of meeting demands. Bottom line is, as we've said before, if, if you look at all the laws, not, not just, what was it? It was SB 2 and 3? Yes, sir. They were both SBs. I couldn't remember one was an HB. But if you look at the bills we signed, but not just those, there were, what, about 10, 10? There's a lot of bills they signed concerning the energy grid in the, in the state of Texas. And I can tell you for a fact, uh, that as we're sitting here today, the energy grid in Texas is better today than it's ever been. Say it again. Yeah, uh, per, um, perfect question. Everyone needs to know how, how many miles will it be? How long will it be? How long will it take? Those are answers uh, that we need engineers and architects uh, and, and the contractors. Uh, to give us the answers too. That's why we had to kick off this process uh, to uh, trigger the hiring of a program manager so the program manager can, uh, can hire the contractors and it will be that team that they will, among other things, go talk to all these property owners and find out where they can build a wall. And the cost of it will, will depend upon the location where it is, uh, what materials exist, what the material cost is at that particular time, and what the design will be. And so th those are the types of questions that go to engineers. And then based upon the cost assessments that they are able to generate, uh, Texas will make decisions about which components of the wall are the first ones to be built. Say it again. Right. We, we, we know it's going to cost far more than $250 million, uh, and as, as opposed to putting down a $2.5 billion or $25 billion uh, cost figure, uh, we're smart enough to hire the experts to go do their job to determine what the cost is before a fuller allocation of money is capable. I did tell you, uh, it's my commitment as well as the commitment of the people in this room, as well as the people in this capital to make sure that we see this project through. So I will tell you this. The federal government is spending all, seemingly all of its resources concerning the border on the people who are trying to enter into the state of Texas. I'm focused on the humanitarian crisis that Texans are suffering through. Texans on the border are suffering through a humanitarian crisis by having their lives disrupted with guns and gangs and being riddled with crime. It's Texans that we have a responsibility as leaders in this state to step up and address their humanitarian crisis, and that is what began today.